Let's put it on. Put what on? The last suit you'll ever wear. These days, comic book films are seen as massive franchises with bankable superstar casts, giant CGI battle sequences, and of course, recognizable comic book IP characters. And for the most part, it's safe to say that comic book media is becoming so common that even smaller, more unknown characters are making their way into the mainstream. But before we saw Batman and Superman sharing the silver screen, and before we saw every generation of Spider-Man film cross over for an epic fan favorite event, movies based on comics were slightly more taboo in Hollywood. And for most, it's a shock to learn that before Agents J and K were busting aliens on the big screen, the Men in Black were protecting Earth from alien threats in the pages of Marvel Comics. Your boy Captain America over here. <laughs> the best of the best of the best, sir. <laughs> Now, the MIB films are significantly more popular in the zeitgeist than the comics ever were, and I personally love this franchise. I'm not saying that everything in the MIB catalog is great, but the stuff that works for me really works for me. And the stuff that doesn't, well, we'll get into that later. But for better or worse, we are in for quite a ride as we follow talking pugs, slimy aliens, space marbles, Martians, roaches, time travel, and the iconic underground organization that keeps you and I safe from all of it. Oh yeah, and these guys too. Wanga. Wanga. <laughs> How you doing, fellas? So grab your darkest pair of sunglasses and, of course, a slice of pie, because we are about to cover what the f you need to know about the Men in Black franchise. See, I, I sense you're not embracing the concept here, right? Pie don't work unless you let it. The Men in Black are a secret government organization that deals in keeping the public safe from extraterrestrial threats and greedy and alien pawnbrokers. When a seasoned Agent K, played by Tommy Lee Jones, recruits a young and reckless NYPD officer, played by Will Smith, the unlikely pair must work together to save the planet from a giant cockroach, a sexy scary squid lady, and even a time-traveling hitman in this franchise that we've all come to know and love. That kind of makes you proud, doesn't it? Huh? Along the way, we learn more about the complicated relationship between the two partners and the Men in Black organization they work for. And as we do here on the show, we are going to start by introducing you to the franchise's most iconic characters first. So let's go. Agent J. Jay is a cocky and impulsive NYPD officer who will go to any length to get his guy. He starts off as a slick, sarcastic, and inexperienced agent, but he grows into one of MIB's top agents over his three-movie arc so far. He's funny, he's charming, he's brave, and he's a bit of a headache for his partner. Uh, look, I'm sorry, not to change the subject or anything, but when was the last time you had a CAT scan? About six months ago, it's company policy. Agent K. K is a kind of hard-boiled detective type who doesn't have time for pleasantries, laughs, or bullshit, but always has time for a slice of pie. My granddaddy always said, if you got a problem that you can't solve, it helps to get out of your head, pie. It's good. K is a mentor to Jay and serves as somewhat of a father figure, which we will continue to learn more and more about as the story continues. K has been played by Tommy Lee Jones and Josh Brolin in the same continuity of this franchise, and both actors perfectly capture the character that Jones helped create, the Worms. These guys are MIB allies who love drinking coffee, smoking cigarettes, and talking trash. They're instantly recognizable in the franchise and have become somewhat of a mascot over the years. Frank, an alien informant for the Men in Black who eventually gets a little black suit of his own. He's witty, gritty, and doesn't take shit from anyone. Except the MIB. <laughs> he definitely takes shit from them. You humans, when are you gonna learn that size doesn't matter? Just because something's important doesn't mean it's not very, very small. Zed. Zed is the head honcho at MIB, and he's just as hard-assed as K, but with even less tolerance for Jay's antics. K, keep your ears open on this one. We're not hosting an intergalactic kegger down here. Jeebs. 
played by monk actor Tony Shalhoub, Jeeves is a pawnbroker who is secretly an alien that can regenerate his own body parts, even his head. He's trying to run a completely non-legitimate business of dealing alien weapons through his storefront, and it is wildly entertaining, and his involvement really serves the world building, especially in this first movie. Jeffrey I just fucking love this guy. He's not so much important, but he's a personal favorite of mine. Yeah, break the laser line? No, don't break it! Not I mean when I'm fast enough! Sounds good! Oof, honestly, I could keep going, but these are really the most important characters to know, and I really want to talk about the movies now, so... Men in Black was released in 1997 and was directed by Barry Sonnenfeld, who also directed the following two Men in Black movies. Steven Spielberg and his production company, Amblin Entertainment, produced, and of course, the film stars a post-Fresh Prince Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones. First off, you chose me, so you recognize the skills. This movie is hands down one of my favorite movies of the 1990s. This movie took some very creative liberties with the writing and characters to better suit the vision of Ed Solomon, who developed the screenplay. Men in Black brings bold and meaningful commentary and themes to a quirky and endearing buddy cop film that is still relevant today. Themes of immigration can be found in the very opening scene when we're first introduced to the Men in Black. Agent K is investigating a truckload of illegal aliens who have been pulled over by local police. The turn of the scene is when the immigrants are discovered to literally be aliens. Looks like you fell off the bus in the wrong part of town, amigo. In fact, I'm gonna bet dollars to pay so you're not from anywhere near here. Now, within the context of this movie, aliens are not seen by the MIB as inherently bad or threatening. In fact, the agency deals more with placing and concealing aliens that immigrate to Earth and allowing them to live freely among humans as long as they can blend in. You know, it's actually kind of... So, the main anchor of the story is the relationship between Agent J, played by Will Smith, and Agent K, played by Tommy Lee Jones. J, formerly known as Officer James Edwards, is a thrill-seeking NYPD officer who is determined to make a difference. After an alien encounter, he's recruited by K and introduced to an entire underground world that works like an embassy to manage relations between Earth and other planets. So, Jay decides that he does want the answers to the universe, and he joins up with the Men in Black. And his decision came just in time, as the slimy and gnarly cockroach alien has already landed on Earth and pulled an invasion of the body snatchers on this poor farmer named Edgar. Uh, is that better? The plan is simple. The cockroach wants to steal a tiny subatomic galaxy from an alien resident of Earth who protects it. He wants to use it to destroy the Archelian race, which is a royal species of alien. J and K need to find the galaxy and keep it safe before Edgar can get to it. The problem is, nobody knows where to find it. To prevent war, the galaxy is on Orion's belt. What the hell does that mean? Now, as far as Orion's belt and the galaxy, the reveal is very fun and surprising when it's revealed that Orion is the name of a cat and his collar is Orion's belt, which holds the galaxy on it. So the galaxy is on Orion's belt, which leads the MIB on a race against the clock to save the planet, but they're gonna need some help. So the movie introduces us to many wonderful characters as J and K basically work as beat detectives and go door to door looking for leads. We meet Jeebs, the pawnbroker who deals in the usual chains, VCRs, speakers, and an arsenal of lethal weapons built with alien tech. If you recognize anything from this franchise, it's very likely that it is this. Do you have any idea how much that stings? Show us the merchandise, you're gonna lose another head, Jeeves. We meet more MIB agents like Zed, the man in charge, famous of course for party pooping the intergalactic kegger. We also meet Frank, my personal favorite character from Men in Black 2, spoiler alert, and I love how this movie sneaks in a little commentary here by just showing us this one shot. Now that's the worst disguise ever. That guy's definitely an alien. You don't like it? You can kiss my furry little butt. Look, we're not bad people. Of course we would assume that this dude is an alien over this adorable little guy, right? And we can't forget about Nebel and the Worms, of course. I adore these weird little homies, and so did the masses, because we will see much more of them in the following movies. And we also meet Laurel, played by Linda Fiorentino, and she's a coroner who helps J and K locate Orion's belt. 
Her and Jay also have a cute little romance kind of brewing up, and it really doesn't go anywhere, but it's nice to see. Also, I encourage all of you to count how many times Jay or Kay erase someone's memory with the Neuralizer in this franchise. I love it every single time. I even remember when I was a kid, I was obsessed with this cool MIB tech. Like, I wanted to build shit like this and hunt for aliens around the neighborhood myself. Like, the scene when Kay has Jay press the red button in the car and they drive upside down, totally iconic. I would compare this first movie's comedy, sharp writing, and gritty tone to another fan favorite franchise of mine, Ghostbusters. As J and K get closer to finding the answers they need, Edgar is getting closer as well, and leaving behind a disgusting, slimy body count, including a soon-to-be returning character played by David Cross, and he is amazing both times we see him in this franchise. Now, we gotta talk about the special effects of this movie, because I kid you not, it still looks good. In fact, I would say that the look of the digital effects in this movie are better than they were in the second movie. From the look of this gnarly cockroach, to the slime and goo, to the worms, to the epic transitions and establishing shots done in CGI, it all looks so solid. I also love the emotional ending, where Jay becomes a senior agent and Kay retires, and Jay is forced to neuralize Kay and erase his memories of ever working with the men in black. It still makes me want to cry. No. You won't. And also, shout out to this epic final battle. Too late. <laughs> Men in Black made $590 million at the box office and further launched Smith into the slaposphere. I, I mean, stratosphere. Oh, wow! That was a good shot, though, right? The success of the movie also spawned a very odd turn in animation, with the 1997 series of the same name. The cartoon focused on Jay and K and their adventures, and it tries to exist in the same continuity as the film, but it fails in its concept, as K retired at the end of the first movie. But the series ran for 53 episodes, and I think I saw like six of them, and they weren't bad, but they really weren't that good. All right, now Men in Black 2 is one that didn't work for everyone. It was released in 2002, about five years after the first one, and it continues the story of the original film in a very simple way, as in it kind of just forces the story back into the same situation as the first film. Men in Black 2 follows the story of Agent J, now a senior agent with Men in Black. He's struggling to find a suitable new partner to replace K, and not doing too well. But when Serlina, an alien from K's past who seeks to destroy the planet, crash lands and takes over the MIB headquarters, it's up to Jay to find a now retired Agent K and convince him to save the planet one more time. The last suit you'll ever wear. Again. This time, instead of meeting a giant cockroach in the opening scene of the film, we meet Serlina, a plant alien who takes on the shape of a supermodel. And I love the way they shot the opening of this scene to make the ship look like it's massive and then it's revealed to be like a foot tall. That's amazing. The reintroduction to Agent J is significantly bigger in spectacle than the opening scenes of the first film. It shows J and his new partner saving a subway car from a giant worm, and J is going on a hilarious tangent about how New Yorkers refuse to act accordingly to the horrors they witness. Also seems like a bit of a commentary on the idea of sequels. That's the problem with all y'all New Yorkers. Oh, we've seen it all. Oh no, a 600 foot worm, save us Mr. Black Man. Listen, overall, I love this movie. I know it doesn't capture the same magic as the first one, no matter how hard it tries to rehash the exact same story, but for me, it works anyway. The idea is that Jay needs to find Kay and get him his memories back so that Kay can remember where the light of Zortha is hidden. And that's basically the Orion's belt of this movie for all intents and purposes. But the dynamic between Jay and Kay is a bit different in this movie, with Jay being a more mature and experienced agent and Kay being a postman with no knowledge of the extraterrestrial. Brown paper and triple twist twine are the preferred media. Thank you for your time. 
So Jay convinces Kay to come back after the iconic post office alien reveal scene. I also love the alien design in this movie specifically. I know that they all look a little bit more cartoony as the movies progress, but in this movie, I think it was just right. So once Kay comes back, the movie mostly follows the same beats as the first one, but with the dynamic between Jay and Kay being kind of flipped. And of course, it is a sequel after all, so everything they do is twice as big. We do get the return of Jeebs, and while I love this scene, I can't help but comment on the CGI effects when Jeebs' head grows back. We see it twice, and it looks much more digital and uglier than it did five years prior in the first film. It's a bit uncanny, and it just looks gummy. I take that back. He looked like crap. <laughs> The same can be said for Johnny Knoxville's character, the dude with two heads. While I love the little details like the smaller head having different teeth for some reason, the CGI just looks a little bit off. I do love the addition of Rosario Dawson in this movie. She's like the new Laurel for all intents and purposes, but her character has a lot more to do. She works at a pizza parlor in New York that is somehow involved in solving this mystery. So Jeebs gets Kay his memories back by using this ghetto deneuralizer thing after theirs was destroyed. Jay and Kay need to enlist the help of some fun aliens in order to find the light of Zortha before Serlina does. Does this sound like the first movie at all? get used to it. The way this movie turns up the comedy is divisive among the franchise, but personally, I see the movie as a loving continuation with the characters that are more experienced and thus more relaxed and humorous in their approach. You're gonna neuralize me. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. You took me to a public place so I wouldn't make a scene. You making a scene. So, Serlina has taken over MIB headquarters and kidnapped everyone inside. So now, our heroes are on the way to save the day. They drop Rosario Dawson's character off with the worms, and this scene is delightful for fans of these weird creatures. Jay, we're playing Twister. What's up, Jay? Hey. Hey, quit touching my butt. Sorry, I thought it was your face. The relationship between Jay and Laura also gets some quick development. These movies have a lot of scenes that involve the characters eating pie, and after Jay takes Laura out for a slice, they basically fall madly in love right then and there. Hmm. You need pie. I also must say that I dearly enjoy the second act of this film with the scavenger hunt that Jay and Kay go on. They're looking for the light of Zortha, and Kay has left behind a trail of extremely unhelpful clues from before he got his memories erased. And it is so much fun watching them search New York for pieces of this puzzle and growing increasingly more confused at every turn. And I suppose when we open a locker, we'll find another clue. That's the plan. So, as it turns out, Kay's history with Serlina goes back to her first contact decades before. Kay seemingly shot the light of Zortha into space, causing her to leave Earth. Well, towards the end of the movie, we learn that Kay actually left the light of Zartha on planet Earth and hid it in plain sight. When you get sad, it always seems to rain. Well, lots of people get sad when it rains. It rains because you're sad. We find out that Rosario Dawson's character is the Light of Zortha, and like the emotional weight of Kay retiring at the end of the first movie, this movie attempts to make the emotional reaction come from this development. They shoot Laura into space and blast Serlina down right before she can get to her, and the planet is saved. The movie wraps up with Jay and Kay partnered up once again, and the audiences were left waiting for an entire decade for another adventure with these two heroes. MIB 3 is a tricky one. Some folks look at this movie as too little, too late, and while it certainly was late in the franchise, I have nothing but good things to say about it. Men in Black 3 follows Jay as he travels through time to help save Kay from an alien assassin that aims to take him out. Jay has to team up with a younger Kay in the 1960s, played perfectly by Josh Brolin, as the two must work together to stop Boris from carrying out his plan. It opens in typical Men in Black fashion with introducing us to our big baddie first. Boris the motherfucking animal. It's just Boris. He's escaping from prison and he is pissed. Kay put him there and he's out for revenge. His plan is to go back to the year 1969 and kill Kay and track down an item called the Arknet and use it to bring back his race of aliens. Boris is played by comedic genius Jermaine Clement, who gives an almost Tim Curry-like performance to this alien assassin. He can shoot spikes and like weird bug stuff from his body, and he's obviously traditionally handsome. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.
So the story picks up with Jay and Kay still working in the field as partners for MIB. They're doing some routine check-ins with Earth's resident aliens when they encounter a freshly escaped Boris. Also, Zed is dead in this movie, so no more Rip Torn, which sucks, but also the funeral scene they have for him cracks me up every single time. I have written a hell of a speech for him. People will be moved. Mm-hmm. I worked with Zed for over 40 years, and in all that time, he never invited me to dinner. He never shared a single detail of his personal life. Thank you. So, Boris the Animal goes to Jeffrey, one of my favorite characters in the franchise, to get the device that he needs to go back in time. He uses the device to travel back to 1969 and kill Kay. And so now, because Kay has been dead since 1969, Jay wakes up to a reality where he has a different partner at MIB, and Kay has been a legend of the organization's twilight years. I love the comedy in this scene. It's completely packed with jokes, which some people say is a problem with this movie. But if the jokes hit, they hit. And for me, they do. Ah! Damn it. It's not the tick. So now O is the head of the organization, and she explains to Jay that he's been involved in a temporal fracture, which means he's basically been affected by something that was changed in the past. So O sends Jay to meet Jeffrey and gets sent back to the past to save Kay. Jeffrey is a huge comedic presence in this movie, and this scene is hands down the funniest one in the movie. Michael Chernis plays Jeffrey, and he runs a pawn shop in town sort of similar to Jeebs in the previous films. He also deals in alien merchandise, and his ability to seemingly know a lot yet know nothing at the same time is truly underappreciated. Again, almost every one of these jokes work for me. Dude, they should give you like two black suits. My man, for real? Jay gets back to the 60s and meets Kay one day before Boris goes back to kill him. So this gives Jay one day to save Kay and therefore save the planet. Again. Josh Brolin as Kay is really special in this movie too. He captures Tommy Lee Jones' completely deadpan stare and dry tone while also having that same level of Boy Scout charisma that we know from the character. It still feels similar to the way they were in the first film while also having much more light and fun of a tone. What kind of partner sit in the car all day, every day, 14 years and don't talk? Exactly. This movie mostly follows the Men in Black formula at this point. Jay and Kay need to work together and meet a bunch of exciting aliens to solve a crime and save the world. Along the way, we meet an interesting character named Griffin, who can see all the universe's infinite timelines at once. It's kind of like Dr. Manhattan, you feel me? Griffin's ability would be extremely helpful to these two time nomads, but unfortunately his short attention span, lack of focus, and overly philosophical remarks make his efforts to help way more challenging than our heroes have time for. But Griffin is able to tell them that K and J must go to Florida, deploying the ArcNet into space by attaching it to Apollo 11. This movie makes an attempt to kick in some emotional stuff too, like J and K defeat Boris as they always do, and it's later revealed that on July 11th, 1969, the day of the Apollo launch, Jay's real father died as a direct result of Jay's time travel and the timeline he created. And we see that Agent K has been secretly watching over Jay his entire life to keep him safe. So in a way, this movie is really a father-son story, with Jay learning that Kay has always been there for him and what their relationship really means to him. This is my new favorite moment in human history. Also, I love that they had Bill Hader playing Andy Warhol playing an alien. Incredible. You know, I don't have no problem pimp slapping the shiznit out of Andy Warhol. Why? <laughs> oh, wow! Okay, friends, here is where the fun ends for me. And for some reason, I always imagined MIB as a great trilogy and kind of blocked this Phantom Fourth installment from my mind for a while. But when it came time to write this essay, I knew I was going to have to watch it again. And it, nah, it didn't work for me. Mm -mm. 
MIB International is kind of a reboot, kind of a continuation. It follows a young woman named Molly, played by Tessa Thompson, as she tracks down MIB headquarters after searching for them for over 20 years as a result of witnessing them neuralize her parents after an alien encounter. Molly knows that aliens exist and is determined to find the answers. She joins the agency's London branch, hence International, and is paired up with Agent H, played by Chris Hemsworth, who is supposedly one of the MIB's best agents, but we'll get to that. You know, I'm getting a little sick of hearing people give me this, you've changed crap. I'm the same person I was years ago. The movie opens with an introduction to Agent H and T, played by Liam Neeson, who really did not seem to want to be there because his performance in this movie is so boring. They stop a group of aliens called the Hive from invading Earth, and this establishes them as total legends, I guess. Now, usually, I understand Chris Hemsworth's style of comedy and comedic line delivery, and I even think it works when he's being kind of dumbed down in a script but this movie really doesn't match the character to his reputation. They talk about H as if he's this magnificent, capable agent and he's one of the best to ever wear the black suit, but then when M meets him, he's just a cocky slacker who has no respect for the job. It's a strange decision, and to me, it just doesn't work. Men in black, the morons in black if you ask me. <laughs> what a bunch of dicks. So, M's thing is that she witnessed some alien shit go down when she was a kid and avoided the MIB erasing her memories. So she spent 20 years trying to figure out how to find the MIB and convince them to hire her. This scene makes no sense. Did she really hack into the Hubble telescope to look at Andromeda 2 and we didn't catch her? In the old days, we'd have hired her. So, now that H and M are partnered up, we should be looking forward to getting some of that Tessa Thompson and Chris Hemsworth chemistry like we do in Thor Ragnarok. And for the most part, it's not totally working, but it's not that bad either. Their dynamic just seems a bit silly and disingenuous, and I really think that maybe there was way too much improvising allowed on set because none of this stuff seems written. Yeah, well, I mean, because it's what we're talking about. Um... Because. Also, I think they must have seen the alien one night stand joke in Guardians of the Galaxy and then tried to copy it here, but there is a very unfunny scene where H is almost killed and then has to sleep with an alien lady to save himself. It's odd, and it starts to make the franchise feel less like the Men in Black that we know and more like an attempt to make an MCU version of it. Like, I felt like at any point Chris Evans was just gonna burst through the door and say, I can do this all day. This movie is sort of like a find the mole espionage situation after one of their alien allies dies in an assassination. And I don't think I really understand this. The whole fun of Men in Black is the alien villains and crazy science fiction. This movie is more like a comedy spy thriller with some ugly and overused CGI aliens sprinkled in for continuity. Wait, don't touch him! Oh, 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 God. Like, every single alien we meet looks more like something out of a Pixar movie than a Men in Black movie. They're all neon-colored or adorable creatures with funny or cute voices, and MIB needs these things to be visually provoking, and in this movie, they just aren't. Aside from the jokes that fall flat and the logic of the story that makes no sense, there are some moments that aren't completely hopeless. Like, some of the cinematography is good and the fight sequences are pretty entertaining most of the time. As H and M get closer to finding the mole and getting the weapon they need to defend themselves from the hive, Liam Neeson's character grows more and more annoying and cliche as he seems to only exist in this movie to make us not trust him. There's no stopping this. With the weapon out of the way, every planet will fall. And then it's finally revealed that he is an alien the entire time. Whatever. M saves the world and H gets promoted instead of her. Okay. And basically the movie ends with the open opportunity for more franchise films. But after the underwhelming reception of the movie, any plans to continue this franchise were scrapped. And maybe it's for the better. I look good in black. I'm boring me. I guess Tessa Thompson saved the universe, but couldn't save the franchise, am I right? Okay, this was a fun one, and with these movies, I would highly recommend just watching the first three movies and taking that as the full story. You can definitely skip MIB International, and if you're looking for a little extra something, I guess the cartoon is always around. But when it comes to this franchise, we can always go back to the good times and relive the excitement of our first brush with these men in black and enjoy the comedy, drama, and commentary of this comic book adaptation. And that, my friends, is what the f 
like you need to know about the MIB franchise. Yeah, and, and, and I'm gonna be back to talk about them Rolexes. <laughs>